Welcome to the Standard Deviations Podcast, presented by Orion Advisor Solutions and hosted by Dr. Daniel Crosby, Orion's Chief Behavioral Officer and New York Times bestselling author. Each week, Dr. Crosby interviews a fascinating new guest on a range of compelling topics, from literature to psychology to financial wellness. To learn more about Dr. Crosby's behavioral finance work at Orion, visit www.orion.com. Hello, and welcome to the Standard Deviations Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Daniel Crosby. I'm joined today by Dr. Sonia Luter, Director of Institutional Research and Education at Herbers & Company. She is past president of the Financial Therapy Association, and she's here today to talk about her most recent research into happiness and money that caught my eye and was super fascinating to me. So thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. And just for the audience record, you promised that this would be fun. Yeah, so I know. Let's I, not lose track. I took that a little personally. I sent you the like, hey, are we still on for today? And you were like, is this going to be fun? I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I know. Holding you to it. I know no other way. This is, this is how fun is how I roll. So let's start with some fun. Tell us about who you are, uh, how you got to this lofty place in your career, and just tell us about your work and your research interests. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go way back and tell you about going to grad school. So I was set to become a financial planner, just like all of my friends. And then I decided somewhat last minute to go on to take more school and therapy. And I think that really threw people for a loop because I was on the financial planning track. And at that point in time, we weren't really talking a lot about this mix of personal finances with relationship dynamics. And so it seemed very odd for people. So I think they might have thought I was a tiny bit crazy, but that really set my career going. And I haven't looked back since. I worked as a therapist in multiple settings unrelated to personal finances in some ways. Like when I was doing my PhD down at Texas Tech, I worked at a drug and alcohol recovery center, seemingly unrelated to personal finances. However, a little known fact is when people are recovering from drugs and alcohol, they often will take up another addiction. And oftentimes that addiction is financial oriented, whether it's gambling or um, compulsive spending or maybe even compulsive hoarding, because it's that need to continue on with that addiction pattern. And as a society, we seem to think that gambling and overspending hoarding are all more socially acceptable than using drugs and alcohol. So also while I was at tech, I worked at Red to Black, which is their financial counseling center. And then when I came back after finishing my PhD, I started at K-State, Kansas State University. And from day one, we started collecting data with PowerCut Financial Counseling, which has been really informative over the years in terms of what types of students are seeking financial assistance and how it's improving their outcomes for school, like their GPA and likelihood of succeeding in college. And I stayed there at K-State for quite a while, climbed the ladder all the way up to endowed professor and department head. And then I left just recently for private industry. So now I'm at Herbers and Company, loving it, serve as their director of research and education. And really now just trying to figure out what advisors need to serve their clients better, help their firms grow, and also looking at what clients want and how we can teach financial planners to deliver those things. So if if you're cool with it, I want to rewind a bit to the to the piece about addiction. If things like whatever, sexual addiction, gambling, substance use, all of these things are symptoms, what, what was your, what was sort of the underlying cause? If it seems like you're sometimes we societally are sort of treating symptoms, but that if there's sort of this root cause that doesn't go away, it just springs up in a new place. Absolutely. That, yes. I mean, we all should make that connection so easily as you did, but we don't. And really, it is that underlying issue, most commonly something related to self-esteem or this need for for love that wasn't maybe obtained early in life, or maybe there was some sort of abuse situation that happened and that trust was lost. 
but almost always comes down to something related to sense of self. So I need to improve my self-esteem. I need to improve my trust of others, uh, maybe increase my dependency as crazy as that sounds, but there are people who get into this place to where they're almost Mm anti-dependent and they will not accept help from others. So really getting that healthy balance of accepting help from one another. Everything I just said is so parallel to personal finances, right? Well, so, uh, you know, I read once that 25% of visits to a general practitioner result in a referral to a mental health professional because, you know, we know that mental health symptoms and, and bodily symptoms are so, you know, deeply intertwined. And a lot of what may manifest as sort of a physical symptom is symptomatic of something of something in your head. What do you think the numbers would look like in terms of financial therapy and therapy therapy? Like what percentage of of clients that are going to therapy for ostensibly other than financial reasons need an element of financial counseling as well? This is not a very research thing to do, Daniel, but I would say 100 percent. It's it's way up there. And I say that with a fairly high degree of certainty because when I was working as a therapist, of course, I'm looking for more of the financial stuff because that's also what I'm trained in. But my peers were also talking about the financial issues that were coming up in their therapy sessions and them not knowing what to do with that information. So there is very much a huge overlap. And furthermore, as a society, I think it's changing a little bit with the pandemic, but generally speaking, it's more elite, if you will, to do anything that starts with financial Hmm. as opposed to anything that starts with therapy or counseling. Uh, So you're saying that almost something like financial therapy could be sort of a soft foot in the door towards more call it proper mental health counseling because it's seen as sort of more socially acceptable. It's not as stigmatized. Absolutely. Which is a pretty scary thought for financial planners. If you just really stop and think about the power that you have of somebody is coming to you for help and there is a financial element of it, but there might be something else that you should also be looking for and just being aware of. You don't need to take care of that issue, but you need to at least be aware of these other things that are going on in a person's life. So I sent you all these prepared questions, but then you told me to have fun and I'm, I'm having fun talking about this. So if you don't, if you don't, Let's do it. if you don't mind one more rabbit trail, what were some of the most common sort of manifestations of, of financial dysfunction that you saw either with individuals or couples what did you see? Where did they get sideways? Because we know forever it's been the number one stressor on the minds of Americans. It's sort of cited as, as a primary cause of divorce and separation. But what were you seeing from, from where you were in the trenches? Yeah, a lot of financial enabling and financial dependency. So on the one end, you've got the people who are the financial enablers continuing to give money. Maybe it's to their spouse, but oftentimes it's to children is what I would see. So an adult who is giving money to their adult child for things that should not be paid for, like Mm -hmm. a person's cell phone, a 30-year-old cell phone or a 30-year-old's car insurance or, or even housing in some situations. So that almost a need to show a person's love but they don't know how to do it. So, well, let me just give them money and let me just pay for this stuff for them so they know how much I love them. Mm. Of course, being on the receiving end, we know that that's not what that person needs. Like they can probably pay their own cell phone. They can probably get their own insurance. It's going to take some time and effort because they've never had to do it before, but that's not what they need from their parent more than likely. Opposite end, you've got the financial dependent people who are absolutely reliant on somebody else to care for them. And we would oftentimes see this in terms of spousal relationships. And I'm making it seem as if it's a bad thing or that there wasn't a good relationship dynamic for those people, but that's not the case sometimes. Like we saw this a lot with older people 
in their 50s, 60s, 70s to where one spouse died, oftentimes the male, and the wife would come in for financial therapy And she had no idea what their financial situation looked like because she had become reliant on her spouse and he took care of the bills. He took care of the investments, all of the accounts, like whenever there was a need to call the banker or the broker, that was him. And she simply multiple times, I I keep saying it singularly, but this was multiple times, had no idea how to even access the information. Mm. So it's clear to me that I got to have you back to talk about more stories from from the financial therapist couch. One last one, and then I promise I'll get to the the prepared questions. I had a friend from church a few years back come to me and sort of lay bare his financial situation. He had a he had some kids, you know, he had a couple of kids, many of them just a couple years younger than me at the time. So, you know, late 30s, early 40s. Um, that he was supporting in pretty dramatic ways. And and sort of simultaneously, he had this fairly anemic retirement fund. And this gentleman is, you know, middle-class white guy. And I felt very confident saying, cut your kids off, let them figure it out. They're all college educated. They can, they can swim, let them go. But then I've also worked in contexts where, where that sort of attitude felt sort of culturally inappropriate. You know, I've lived abroad, I've lived in Asia, where there's more of a collectivistic mindset. I've worked in Hawaii, uh, where there was absolutely a more collectivistic mindset. And sometimes this advice to put on your own oxygen mask first felt countercultural. If you're meeting with a Filipino family who's, who's barely squeaking by in the States making minimum wage, and yet the exchange rate is 50 to 1 for the dollars that they send back to Manila... And so I just was never quite as comfortable saying, hey, put your own oxygen mask on first, because it felt like a cultural imperative that was there and a need that was more real than when I'm talking to my middle class, uh, you know, suburban white guy friend. Can you speak to that? Because I don't know that this sort of put your own oxygen mask on first imperative is, is always equally applicable. Yeah, that's such a wonderful point. And ideally, in a planner client relationship, we would have already established what the person's values were. Mm. And we could have assessed or made a reasonable assumption based off of where a person's values lied. But several things come to mind when you're talking there in terms of why is a person giving that information, giving that money to their children? That's what we need to address. Is this their way of showing love? If so, maybe we can discuss other ways that they could show their love and both of you get to meet your needs. Mm -hmm. I get to secure my own financial security and my children don't have to pay for my expenses later, but yeah, I can still show them love by doing this other thing, maybe meeting them for dinner every Sunday afternoon, whatever the case may be. Or what's the other, you know, what's the other thing that their motivation for this? I think another thing that comes to mind is really illuminating for people, keeping in mind their values, that we oftentimes see wealth skipping generations. Mm-hmm. And it's because of these behaviors that you're talking about. So maybe I grew up poor and I don't want my children to experience that. So I am going to shower them with gifts and investments so that they never had to experience the perils that I experienced. Mm-hmm. Now imagine me as my child. I've got everything I could possibly need. I've got all of the nice clothes. I've went through college without having to take on any debt. And then, so I have all of this excess cash, excess cash, if you will, Mm -hmm. and I can spend that and I can spend it on luxuries and I don't have to focus on saving or repaying debt. And that sense of focus on compound interest isn't quite the same. Mm -hmm. And so we often see that generation lose the wealth again. And then now they have children and their children be like, well, I'm not going to do that. My parents were foolishly spending their money on this and that. And now I have to pay for college on my own. So now here they come in 
saving all this money. And so I think showing people, having them talk about their, the generation above them, what was that like observing that behavior? What's it like been, what's it been like for me? And what do I really want for my children? Is it the same as what I have now? Then let's teach them how to get that on their own or how we can do that together versus just trying to force something onto another person because of your past experiences. Right. So I like the part about the clarification of values. And I think in the case of my friend, I don't know that I ever clarified it explicitly, but I I felt like it was more of this sort of, this is how I show my love versus a necessity where in the other case, it, it felt more, you know, A, culturally aligned and B, more, more sort of life and death uh, for the people involved. But I, I love that idea of sort of clarifying the values, making sure your advice is consistent with those values and that those have been illuminated by the people in question. Because I think a lot of times these behaviors sort of operate without a whole lot of conscious awareness. They may not they may not know that they're doing it for the reason of, of that's how I show love until, you know, you really have that conversation. And, and once it's been brought to the light, it can be worked with and changed and, and all that. So. Right. Powerful. And let's be clear that they need to discover that on their yes. own, because as soon as you tell them, Oh, this is your value. Mm-hmm. Yes. They're going to get defensive. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. How many, how many therapists does it take to change a light bulb? Right. One has, it has to want to change. Yes. Um, okay. So let's get back to the lecture at hand. The thing that brought me here, the thing that led me to reach out to you, I've been aware of your work for many years, but I was really drawn in by this recent work. Uh, you wrote a piece called Want to Be Happy, Hire a Financial Advisor. And I thought it was just fascinating. It's going to form the, the foundation of the rest of our conversation, unless I journey down more fun rabbit holes. Uh, But like any good shrink, I have to start by asking, how did you operationalize happiness, right? We, we, uh, we shrink study these things that are sort of ephemeral. They're sort of hard to get your arms around. What was the form and structure that you gave to happiness and how did you arrive at that? Yeah, well, it's a really fabulous question and one that's difficult to explain without getting in deep into statistics. So I'll give you the fun version because yeah. we're keeping it we're fun keeping today. It, we're keeping it fun. Yes. Uh, we collected a number of statements that we've seen over time based in therapy, psychotherapy, in terms of what is it that consume that measures consumers' daily behaviors, their attitudes, their interactions, things like I am content. People say I look happy. My community is engaging. I enjoy helping other people, et cetera. And then we did some factor analysis, some um, statistical analysis to be able to condense those items down. And what we saw is all of those items grouped around four very clear areas, one that related to fulfillment. How content am I with my life? Am I spending my time in the way that gives me the greatest happiness? And then there is another set of items that grouped around intention. So I enjoy helping other people, people respect me, et cetera. And then a separate group of items that really clustered around this idea of impact. So I am making a difference in my community. I'm generous with my time, et cetera. And then gratefulness. So I'm grateful and thankful for where I am right now in the presence. And then, so those were our four areas of happiness, but then we really wanted to look at a person's self-report of happiness. So how happy do you say that you are with your personal finances? How happy do you say that you are with your relationship? And what we saw was the our four items and these measures of self-reported happiness, highly correlated, highly predictive, um, our four areas, highly predictive of a person's self-report of happiness with finances, their partner, um, their communication in general. So really our four areas are meant to really be a holistic view of a person's 
contentment and general fulfillment with where they are right now. All right. So one more time. So everyone has sort of the mental scaffolding, fulfillment, intention, impact, and gratefulness. That's right. Now, in your study, this was awesome. And of course, it anytime a study confirms your preconceptions and your biases, you're very happy. So this study did that for me. Uh, the research found that these four happiness factors were heightened in two thirds of those who worked with advisors versus just one third who did not, uh, which was, of course, statistically significant. This is fairly sizable, it would seem. Talk me through what sense you make of this finding. To what do you attribute this this sizable happiness gap? Yeah. So in the previous question, you asked that or you made the statement that any good shrink would want to understand the scaffolding around this. Any good researcher would want to know what other how other people interpret the research. So I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask you the exact same question, actually. Well, so I have a couple of uh, this is very devious, by the way. I have a couple a, a couple of things come to mind. Right. And one is part of the next question is, is there a confound? Right. Like, is it something is there sort of some pollutant variable, which is that, you know, happier people are inherently more likely to seek out uh, advice, happier people are more coachable, sort of more amenable to, to getting help. So that would be one thing I would want to consider. Uh, I think another thing that I would consider, though, is just like our earlier conversation, money touches every part of your life. And so if you can offload, some of the uh, worry and thinking around money, every part of your life is elevated. You've effectively offloaded that concern to a third party. Now you can go play with the grandkids, fly a kite, take long walks on the beach, do all the things that, that sort of make life worth living. And that's one less worry. So those would be sort of the two paths I would want to go down is you know, the skeptical guy path of, is there something else here that could be muddying the water? Uh, and then the believer path of, of, oh, you know, this makes life easier and lets me focus on what matters. Oh, that's super interesting. And I think that we both must have been trained in systems theory <laughs> because <laughs> for the listeners who have never heard that word or need a quick reminder, any change in one part of the system is going to influence every other connected system. So if something goes wrong at work, I'm likely to come home and be kind of a grouch and maybe not be so nice to my family. And then they're going to get crabby and then they're going to take that and interact with their teacher the next day and get into trouble. And the whole thing spirals out of control because we are part of these systems. And I tend to agree that that's some of what we're picking up here is that the financial planner offers the sense of organization and a plan so that I can kind of hold that system together nice and tight to where I don't have to dedicate mental energy to thinking about my personal finances. There's somebody out there who's thinking about it, who we've come up with our roadmap and I just need to follow the map. And, and that's like, I put that in auto drive. We're good to go there. I think another thing that we could be seeing, keeping in mind that this data was collected at the end of 2021, is that I'm going to say that these people are wealthy. Everybody who was in this survey had assets of $250,000 or more. They were likely had the privilege of working from home. They're likely still working from home. And part of that is very convenient. Part of that introduces a sense of isolation or maybe um, comfort when you do get the opportunity to have a conversation with another person. And so I think maybe some of what we're seeing is that the financial planner provides the opportunity to have these deep conversations that maybe you could have had in more social settings that we haven't been afforded the opportunity in the last couple of years. So it's just simply this ability to talk with somebody about all of those stuff that's rolling around in your head. What if I did this or what should I do? What's it going to be like in 20 years? So again, it comes back to that roadmap of what that financial planner provides. I think that's part of it. Um, I mean, you bring up a great question, it, which came first, the happiness 
or seeking a financial advisor. I don't know. Um, we don't have that data. Uh, it goes back to the old chicken and egg analogy. I don't know. But what I do know is that there's a very high correlation. People who go to a financial advisor are more fulfilled. They live with intention. They live with impact. And they're more grateful in their life. We can control that. That's very easy to control, hiring a financial advisor. So if you do hire a financial advisor, chances are you will see increases in these four areas of happiness because that's we're seeing two thirds of people are happier with a financial advisor than not. Um, so I think that's a pretty interesting thing to think about that even if we don't know which part of the system was modified first, we know that if we modify seeking a financial advisor, it's probably going to have the systemic impact in these other parts of our lives too. Yeah, it's interesting. I saw some, I, I like this idea. It was an angle I had not considered. I, this idea of advisor as almost a point of social contact and, and therapeutic outlet during a hard time. My listeners are going to kill me. I think I've quoted this three times in a row, but it blew my mind. There was research I just saw out of Accenture that said that 91% of people, when they asked people what they were looking for an advisor, 91% said someone who gets me. That was the most popular answer. Second most popular answer, someone who shares my value values. Third most popular answer was someone I can basically hang out with socially. And it was so surprising to me. It was like, I just want a buddy. Like, you know, it's like, I want a buddy who understands me and my money and can kind of take this off my plate, but someone I can really connect with. So I don't, I think it would be foolish of us to, to overlook the possibility that advisors could have had a real positive psychological impact on, on their clients during the last two years that have been profoundly tough. And as I've talked about on this show before, have resulted in an epidemic of loneliness and social isolation and disconnection and all of the accompanying uh, psychological fallout from, from that, you know, social disconnection. So, yeah. okay. So you can't, you can't ask me what I think of this next question because I was shocked by it and I just don't know. So you cannot, okay. put, you cannot put me on the spot. I thought this was <laughs> such a fascinating finding though. You found that those who worked with an advisor had significantly better communication with their with their marital partners, right, with their spouses. Too. That was that was more surprising to me than perhaps the happiness. I had seen I had seen research out of Canada and other places that that suggested that people who worked with financial professionals were happier. But why would receiving financial advice produce better communication outcomes between a couple? It's so fascinating that this is the question that was really baffling for you because this one seemed so readily obvious to me from my prior work, a lot of it having to do with therapy and a lot of my previous research has been the connection of love and money. And we see time and time again that so many different things here. The amount that a couple argues about money at the beginning of their relationship, this is my research from quite a long time ago, is more predictive of relationship satisfaction down the road than the amount that they're arguing about money down the road. Hmm. So those very early moments of forming their relationship and talking about money are so significant in terms of relationship outcomes. And the reason why I think this is the case is because you're talking about values. And if you're not talking about values, how are you ever going to hold a future together with this person? And I think that is exactly what the financial advisor is providing, is this opportunity to have conversations about money. This Couples likely have not just formed their relationship from our study, but it's this idea that the financial advisor provides that mediator role, if you will, in terms of allowing that conversation to happen. You and I both have young children. At the end of the workday, the first thing that comes to mind is not, oh, hey, we need to review our budget or, hey, let's talk about our retirement plan and just make sure everything's on track. 
it's, I mean, it's absurd to even think that we would have time for that or energy to discuss that at the end of the day. But if there's a time during the day to where you and your partner are allowed this opportunity, an hour, maybe even two hours to go sit and focus on your financial life together and your financial life at a future point in time, i.e. your life at a future point in time, that's amazing. And so, of course, they're going to have better communication because the opportunity has been presented to them. It's been scheduled into their day to actually have that focused time to talk about money that we probably are not going to just schedule on our own by ourselves without that intervening third party. So, first of all, my listeners will note that you just roasted me in a very gentle way. It was very <laughs> gentle. <laughs> <laughs> but not on purpose. You, you, you definitely roasted my psychoanalytic skills and I have to go back and sharpen them. But, you know, it, it occurs to me that one of the things that we used to do uh, is something called paradoxical intention. You know what it is, but it's, you know, you would have someone with, with some anxiety come in to see you and you would say something like, hey, um, Tuesdays from four to five, you should go worry nonstop. Like your, your assignment is to wring your hands and imagine every catastrophic scenario under the sun uh, every Tuesday from four to five. I'll see you next week. Tell me how it went. And it has sort of this dual impact of, first of all, you, you sort of realize the absurdity of it. And you're like, what? Like, why, you know, why would I do this? But then second of all, it compartmentalizes it. And I think one of the reasons now that now that I've been roasted and I, and I think about it a little bit more. Is that, <laughs> My apologies. No, no, no. It was, it, it was well-deserved. So um, is a, an advisor provi- provides a, an element of compartmentalization two, Absolutely. three, four times a year. We're going to talk about money. Money doesn't have to bleed into every weekly conversation, nightly conversation, because you're right. Like we're tired. Right. And we want to mm-hmm. focus on other things. Uh, and, and if we can compartmentalize that part of our lives, know that it's in the hands of a, of a trusted partner, then we can focus on uh, uh, communicating around around other things. Last finding we'll talk about from the study that I found fascinating uh, was that after the 1.2 million mark, so everyone in reset, everyone in the study has a quarter of a million dollars or, or better. But after the 1.2 million mark, greater wealth increased happiness in those with an advisor and decreased wealth in those without an advisor. So this is a fascinating study to me. You know, you would would think, you would think that, that it wouldn't be quite as dramatic as it was in the study. So what would cause people with great wealth, but no advice to sort of fall off the happiness cliff as it were? Yeah, it is a cliff. Um, If you haven't seen the paper, you should definitely look at the white paper to see the chart because it's, it's for sure a cliff. And the thing that I think we're seeing here is that those people with $1.2 million without a financial advisor, they don't have that roadmap. And when you have that much assets, you have lots of options available to you. And without the map, we tend to get into this idea of decision paralysis. I have so many options. I don't know what to choose. So it's stressing me out and I'm going to choose nothing, but then that gives me remorse. And so you start seeing this just uncertainty and and paralysis of not knowing what to do at that point in time is what I think is happening. Can I ask you what you think about this one? You, You can. So, you know, I think the role of an advisor is just going to continue to shift and change. I think from the outside looking in, people assume uh, an advisor's role is to sort of whatever, maximize risk-adjusted return or something. Like it's all about the pursuit of more. But at some point when you arrive at whatever we consider to be enough or sort of sufficient, the advisor's role becomes about helping that client achieve happiness, define what enough looks like, help that client so that the goalposts aren't always moving, that they're not falling prey to this sort of uh, lifestyle creep and hedonic adaptation, right? Things like that. So 
the advisor's role, I think, shifts over time. And when a client has significant assets, it's less about, you know, you're, you're sort of moving up Maslow's hierarchy, if you will. Mm-hmm. It's less about, am I going to be able to send my kids to college? Am I going to have a, a food to eat and a, a warm place to sleep? And it becomes about how, what's my legacy? What's the meaning of this? What is enough? And an advisor is skilled in all that. And an advisor has the perspective of having worked with whatever, call it a hundred other clients. Whereas you or I in isolation, we have only this in of one. We only have our personal experience and we don't have any context for that. So I think the advisor's role shifts, but yeah, do go check out the white paper. We are not joking. It is a cliff. Like it falls off so hard after 1.2 million I guess I was less surprised at the effect and more at the size of the effect, but it was really dramatic. Yes. And, you know, I'm so glad that you went down that road because it reminds me about the psychology of financial planning Mm -hmm. and new competency required for CFP professionals. And isn't that wonderful that we're finally now recognizing that it is that Maslow's hierarchy of needs? It's going to be more of the, the psychological innate things that people need assistance aligning their money with. It's not, it's not the basic needs anymore. It's these, these harder things that the financial advisor is going to be helping their clients with. Well, and you get into this, um, you know, the paradox of choice, anyone who's not read that book I'd, or watched that Ted talk, I'd, I'd recommend that, you know, both of those things to you. Uh, my favorite philosopher, Kierkegaard, talks about anxiety as the dizziness of freedom, right? So as you have greater wealth, you have greater capacity, you have greater freedom. But with that freedom comes the dizziness of saying, what do I do with this? You know, what do I do with this million bucks, two million, three million bucks? How do I spend it in a way that, uh, you know, does good in the world, blesses my family, sets me up, like defines my legacy, I think for a while there, you're just in survival mode, right? And and the the upside of being in survival mode is there's not a lot of existential angst. You're just grinding, right? You're just mm-hmm. like, let's let's get this money. Let's make sure we have enough to live. There's not a lot of existential complexity that comes along with that. The way I, I think you see happen when you enter those upper echelons. Absolutely. Okay, so I was super enamored of this piece. Tell us the name of the piece one more time so everyone can go check it out. Want to be happy? Hire a financial advisor. Go get it. Go get it. Go look at the charts. But this is Herbersco.com. Herbersco.com. That's where you can get it. So this isn't your only work by any stretch, though. You've you've authored over 60 peer-reviewed works. And I'm hoping we don't have time for all 60 today. But I'm hoping you could just share one or two pieces of research with us or one or two findings that have been surprising or interesting to you over the course of this uh, esteemed career of yours. (laughs) You're so generous. Um, Okay, well, I did list at least 10 papers here that I wanted to talk about in depth. So let's focus in on one or two. (laughs) Unless you want your first ever two hour podcast. Is it fun to talk about 10 papers? (laughs) <laughs> oh yes, of course it's fun. <laughs> fun for me and you, probably. Yeah. So yeah. Give us um, one or two. Okay, so let's talk about people who live together without being married, because this is one that we're starting to see an increase in naturally, because people can have the big weddings over the last two years. So we do see more. We see marriage rates that are down. Presumably, people are still in relationships. They've still formed a joint household together. What we see with these people, cohabitors, if you will, so unmarried partners living together, is that they accumulate more stuff than financial assets. Hmm. And you see that as a person lives with more people over their life, unmarried, that they tend to accumulate more stuff, non-financial assets, and their financial assets get smaller and smaller with each additional relationship formation. And I find that so fascinating because if you think about the people you know, like we're starting a new household, so we're going to get new furniture, maybe uh, the house itself, maybe new vehicles, the new boat to go with it. 
but we're not quite sure if this relationship is going to make it or not. And the separation of the assets could get messy. So let's just not worry about the financial assets at this point. Let's just live life for what life is right now. Mm. I think this has really serious implications for financial advisors. And, and we need to ask our clients, Hey, like, tell me about your relationship status and what that means in terms of investments and questions you might have with that, because it does have serious financial implications for sure. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I mean, that's very much the trend. People are, I mean, even take COVID out of it. People, uh, fewer people are getting married. People are uh, waiting much longer to get married. People are in general going to have more uh, cohabiting partners over the, over the course of their lifetime. That has, you know, that's this, seemingly love thing, right? That's the seemingly uh, love and marriage conversation. Well, no, it has serious financial implications that that an advisor needs to be aware of. That's fascinating. I know. See, see, this is fun, Daniel. Oh, this is fun. I Give me the other nine. Give me the other nine. <laughs> <laughs> well, one that I'm sure that you've read about, it's getting a little bit old at this point in time, but it continues to amaze me how many financial advisors have implemented the results of this paper. And what I looked at, this was with John Grable, funded by Angie Herbers before I worked for Herbs and Company. We looked at office setting and the impact this had on client stress Mm -hmm. and offices that are set up more like a living room. This was pre-COVID naturally are creating lower stress for clients. And, And we know when people's stress is lower, they are going to be more willing to implement their decisions, the recommendations. People who are under stressed are very myopic focused. So we need to get people out of that stress situation. One easy way to do it is the office setup. So when you return to offices, if you return to offices, create that homey feeling. I think the same could be applied for your virtual background. Make it look comfortable, like someplace that's inviting that you would want to sit and give that relaxed home feel. To keep that stress down, stress is, and there's so many things we could talk about with stress in terms of the impact it has on our behavior and that connection between physiology and behavior is really remarkable. And I think we're just barely touching the surface so far. So my other favorite study to quote recently looked at why people fail to get financial advice, right? Like why they don't ever seek out a financial advisor. And it was, it was fear of judgment was that was the number Mm -hmm. one reason. And I think that an office setup can either uh, help or inhibit, can can sort of emphasize or de-emphasize the power dynamic, right? I mean, it's like if you're sitting behind your giant mahogany desk or whatever with your five screens, I mean, it's a different feeling than if you're sitting in this sort of homey living room. One one feels more judgy. One feels more judgy and formal. One feels more approachable and and familial. So yeah, that's, I, I was aware of that. That's a fascinating study though. And I've seen that, you know, to your credit, I've seen that I've seen advisors pick that up and run with it in a, in a big way. Yeah, I followed up with a few of them and they said their clients love it and mm-hmm. it's been very well received. So that's, <laughs> it, it gave me a sense of relief too. Yeah, it, it reduced your stress. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. All right. You'll have to have me back on and we'll talk about research more. Get Give me at least one more though. Okay, so this one, it's going to go off off the beaten track just a tiny bit. Love it. I married a veterinarian. Veterinarians are very interesting folks. They are very introverted in general. They are very good with talking to animals. I'm not joking you. Maybe not quite as good talking with humans. They do talk to animals. And they have a reputation for not being very good with personal finances because many of them have a lot of debt. A lot of them graduate with easily six figures of student loan debt. And so the assumption is that veterinary students have poor financial literacy. I knew this wasn't true because I was married to one. He's very smart with money. He has, when I met him, a quarter million dollars in student loan debt. Crazy, like an unimaginable amount of debt. And so I really wanted to prove that they 
are not illiterate when it comes to finances. There's something else going on. So did the study with looking at pre-vet students and current vet students. And what we saw was that it's their debt, their current um, debt and their expected total debt that's contributing to their financial satisfaction. And that was highly predictive of carrying depressive symptoms. Veterinarians are among one of the professions that is also notably known for having high suicide rates and presumably because of their debt. So what are these things that are leading up to that? What we saw was it's not actually financial literacy. Their financial literacy levels were actually higher than the average student and higher than the average United States population. So do you think that was interesting? First of all, thank you for defending your husband's honor. That's <laughs> wonderful. Do you think do you think it's sort of an anti-agrarian bias? I mean, is that they get sort of lumped in in, in this sort of anti-agrarian bias? Is that where you think those misconceptions come from? Uh, yeah, possibly. And it's just easy. It's easy to just group people. Sure. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But it seems like, I mean, they're they're smart, right? They've gotten into advanced yes. schooling and things you would assume that they have advanced levels of financial literacy, but no, we assume otherwise because maybe they get lumped in with, you know, this mm-hmm. sort of anti, anti-farm anti bias that it's a throwback or a relic of a bygone era. That's interesting. Yeah. That's really cool. So um, this is fascinating stuff. So thank you for the work that you're doing to move our profession forward, to make it more of a science, to make it more rigorous. Uh, we need more people like you and you will absolutely be back Um, to talk about the other seven studies and maybe the other 57 studies. So um, I love it. We'll do, we'll do a one hour session, one minute lightning rounds of every paper you've ever written. (laughs) (laughs) So thank you again for doing this. If people want to find about more about you and your research, where can folks, uh, where can folks follow your work? Definitely follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter. I post updates there, but also herbersco.com. And you can get into Academy from the herbersco.com website. And that's where I do all of my educational programming. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. And I hope everyone will read the white paper and, and follow Dr. Sonia there. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for tuning in to Standard Deviations. If you can't wait till next week for more behavioral finance insights, visit www.orion.com. All opinions expressed by Dr. Daniel Crosby and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of or endorsement by Orion and its affiliates, subsidiaries, and employees. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for legal, tax, and investment decisions. The opinions are based upon information the participants consider reliable.